It's one of the world's most ambitious engineering projects. A massive hydroelectric dam generating more kilowatts than any other on the planet. To build it, the path of a mighty South American river must be blocked. Thousands of acres of precious wild animal habitat and tens of thousands of homes will disappear in a huge flood. 40,000 workers must battle against the forces of nature, rocketing temperatures, the constant threat of killer floods. Behind it all, the potential for catastrophe. Building the Itaipu Dam will take seven tough years, and this giant quest for energy will demand a devastating price. The Rio Parana. At 4,000 kilometers long, it's South America's second biggest river, outstripped only by the mighty Amazon. For part of its course, the Parana marks the border between Brazil and Paraguay. Here, the river's path is barred by a man-made structure, the Itaipu Dam. It's the world's most powerful hydroelectric dam. It pumps out 90,000 gigawatts every year, enough to power Britain's capital city, London, for over three years. Stretching for seven kilometers, it's two and a half times longer than America's Golden Gate Bridge and stands as high as a 65-story building. It's holding back a body of water nearly 400 times the area of New York's Central Park. Water that plummets through the dam like a giant man-made waterfall to produce electricity. It would take an army of 40,000 workers and $20 billion to build this monstrous structure, almost 50 times the cost of the Hoover Dam. Italy's Piero Sembanelli was one of the dam's key engineers. Possibly we didn't realize how difficult the project was going to be. It's in one of the remotest corners of the world. But why would the most ambitious and powerful dam on the planet be built here? It's the 1960s and Brazil is booming. Its economy is growing by 10% a year, but the population is surging too. Already over 70 million, in three decades Brazil's population will hit 170 million and become one of the top 10 most populous countries in the world. Brazil's growth will create a spiraling demand for energy. The government must find a way to satisfy the power-hungry masses of the future or face economic crisis. But how? The country hasn't got enough oil and gas to head off an energy crisis, and it can't afford to spend big money on fuel imports. But then, someone has a brainwave. Why not use a natural acid that's free and that Brazil has plenty of? Water. A staggering 10% of all the fresh water in the world is found in Brazil. Its 40,000 kilometers of rivers could reach right around the globe. If the vast potential of water could be harnessed by hydroelectric technology, energy demands could be met without costly fuel imports. Brazil is thinking big. The government wants one massive dam to supply a huge chunk of the nation's energy demands. Finding the perfect site for such a big dam won't be easy. The river must have a volume of water great enough to produce the energy needed. It must flow through narrow banks and its bedrock must be strong enough to take the massive weight of the dam walls. This is the obvious spot. The river Iguaçu feeds one of the biggest waterfalls in Brazil but it has only one-eighth of the water needed for the monster dam. 
One by one, engineers check out 50 other sites. None make the grade. But finally, the perfect location is found. The River Parana is the seventh largest in the world, holding four times as much water as America's Colorado River. At a spot called Itaipu, it flows through a deep underwater gorge. Geological surveys show that the bedrock can bear enormous weight. The engineers think it's perfect. But there's a huge obstacle. The gorge sits right on the border between Brazil and its old enemy, Paraguay. In the 19th century, the two countries had fought in a bitter war. Paraguay lost half its territory and half its population was killed. Even over a hundred years later, there was still mistrust between the two peoples. 1966, complex negotiations begin between the two countries. For seven years, the dam project hangs in the balance. But in the end, the lure of vast supplies of energy proves irresistible. On the 26th of April 1973, Brazil and Paraguay finally sign a treaty. The Itaipu Dam gets the green light. If everything goes to plan, it will outstrip some of the world's greatest dam projects. It will be 18 times as long as the mighty Hoover Dam and nine times as heavy. Most importantly, it will produce six times as much electricity. But the most powerful hydro dam in the world will demand sacrifices. Blocking the Rio Parana will create a huge reservoir needed to feed the electric turbines. It will also submerge the river valley under 100 meters of water. A vast area of farmland and forest must be flooded to feed the monster dam. Tens of thousands of people will lose their homes. the habitats of thousands of animal species will disappear forever. As the Itaipu project reaches the point of no return. May 1975. Old enemies Brazil and Paraguay have signed an historic pact. Construction begins to build the biggest hydro dam in the world. It will harness the power of the mighty Parana River. The goal? An energy bonanza for both countries. The $20 billion budget is funded by the Brazil government and by foreign investors. Engineers have found a site on the river that's perfect for the dam. But to build it, they must first divert the Parana from the course it has flowed for thousands of years and reroute it. A massive diversion channel must be carved through the rock of the riverbank. Its job, to temporarily divert the river away from the dam construction site. At two kilometers long and 80 meters deep, it will be the biggest diversion channel ever attempted. But if it fails to divert the river correctly, the whole project is doomed. Piero Sembanelli is the engineer in charge of building the channel. It was a mighty struggle that we fought. The Parana was the most difficult diversion ever tried. Second of May, 1975. Building the Itaipu Dam begins. First job, to dig the channel diverting the river. It will take three years of explosives, mechanical diggers, and sheer brute force to slice through the rock. Meanwhile, others are counting the environmental cost of such a big dam. Once built, the Itaipu Dam will turn the Parana River Valley into a giant reservoir. An area twice the size of Chicago will be flooded with water to a depth of 100 meters. 
As the dig gets underway, environmental consultants are drafted in. Their task, to assess what wild animals and plants can be saved from the coming flood. It's the first dam project to attempt a major rescue plan. But at this stage, there are only 17 people involved, mostly volunteers. Brazilian Fernão Carbonar was one of the team. It was the beginning of the environmental uh, movement all around the world, but regulations weren't as strict and legal requirements as tough as they are today. It's a race against the clock. If the rescue plan isn't completed before the valley is flooded, thousands of animals will perish, and any endangered species living here could be put at risk. And the work is time-consuming. The survey basically consisted of walking through the woods and sighting the animals, looking for their foot tracks. But people live here too some 40,000 of them. Whole villages and small farms, some of them home to families for generations, will be lost forever beneath the flood water. They must be compensated. But the authorities need to know how much to pay out. It's one of the world's biggest ever real estate valuations, and it takes four years to complete. First, the whole area is photographed from the air, to survey homes and farmland. But that doesn't give enough information to calculate compensation. To get more detail, they must send an army of photographers on foot to scour every square meter of the Parana Valley. These men and women are on a mission. They have to get an accurate valuation of every home and its surrounding land. Everything is recorded and photographed. Alberto Frez values hundreds of homes. The houses were measured, described and photographed one by one. And all belongings, even if it was just a stool, it was photographed. While the valuation process is taking forever, the digging of the diversion channel is right on schedule. Three years after digging began, engineers are all set to demolish the channel's concrete seals and send the Great Parana River pouring down the channel. 8 a.m. on October the 20th, 1978. Dynamite charges are set at each end of the channel. It's a tense moment. If the explosion damages the channel, it could set the project back years. It was a fantastic moment, incredible moment. The blast was like a firework. It's working. The mighty Parana is thundering down its new course. It's a momentous achievement. The Itaipu engineers have altered the path of one of South America's biggest rivers. But it's only phase one of the diversion. Some water still flows down the old riverbed. Next, huge temporary dams called coffer dams must be built to force all the water down the diversion channel, away from the dam construction site. They're made by dumping huge pieces of rock into the river until the flow is stopped. The coffer dams might only be temporary, but British engineer Bill Beath knows how secure they have to be. Coffer dams prevent the river from flowing into the area where the dam is being built. Should these collapse during construction, it would be a total disaster. Brazil has some of the most torrential rainfall in the world, and rising water could put the coffer dams under pressure or even burst the walls. That would bring a devastating wall of water down on hundreds of workers. The engineers hope that they would have enough warning of rising river levels to safely evacuate workers. Until the main dam walls are built, all that stands between the workers and the threat of flood is a wall of rubble.
With the river Parana now fully diverted, the biggest job of all, building the huge walls of the Itaipu Dam, can begin. A hydroelectric dam works by dropping water onto turbines, making them turn at great speed to create electricity. The taller the dam, the greater the drop, and the more power is produced. Itaipu's engineers know that the water in the dam must fall a full 100 metres to produce the promised record-breaking amounts of power. But the riverbed is only 50 metres deep. Their solution? Build a series of secondary dams. These will raise the height of the main concrete central dam and make it tall enough to do the job. It means running the dam structure right across the valley for seven kilometers. Autumn 1975. Work starts on the secondary dams. Meanwhile, the valuation of the houses, farms and land in the river valley, which the dam will flood, is completed. Brazilian and Paraguayan authorities learn that before they can submerge the area, they must buy up eight and a half thousand homes and farms. The cost? Half a billion dollars in today's money. That's on top of the 20 billion dollars the dam itself will cost to build. Offers of compensation are rushed out. Most are accepted, but a handful of people mount legal challenges. But engineers are more worried about keeping the secondary dams on schedule. They desperately need more workers, an army of them. Yet the Parana Valley is sparsely populated and remote. Its only town, Foz do Iguaçu, is a small frontier settlement. The nearest big city, Sao Paulo, is a thousand kilometers away. Project managers must choreograph a massive migration of workers into the area. They bus in tens of thousands of workers from all over Brazil. Everything a large town needs, from schools and hospitals to churches and kindergartens, has to be built. New housing estates are built just for dam workers. Massive catering production lines are set up to feed the ever-increasing number of workers. The town of Foz do Iguaçu is growing at an incredible rate. We're really talking about moving into a one-horse town with something like 30,000 workers. What was once a tiny backwater becomes a gold rush town practically overnight. While the new workers set to work on the secondary dams, the engineers are wrestling with the design for the vast main dam that will block the river at its deepest point. All dams must be capable of one thing. They must resist the unimaginably vast pressure of the water in the reservoir behind them. Where geography allows, dams can be simple walls anchored to the surrounding rock. But Itaipu has no such help from the terrain. It must stand alone. So Itaipu must follow a design that relies solely on its own weight. Engineers call it the gravity dam. The idea is to make the structure so heavy the water simply can't move it. To work, the dam will have to weigh 61 million tons. But the dam is only as good as its foundation. The bedrock must be incredibly strong. Any weaknesses could cause the dam to collapse. An unthinkable disaster. The engineers have undertaken a detailed survey. The results are good. The dam's foundations are sound. And the engineers have a money-saving trick up their sleeve. A dam made out of solid concrete would weigh more than it needs to and add huge, unnecessary costs. They plan to make the main dam walls hollow. As long as it has enough weight, it will resist the water pressure. That does not mean that it has to be absolutely solid. It can be hollow and still resist the water pressure. Making the dam hollow means its base can be made even wider with the same amount of concrete. And the walls will slope more gently, pushing the water pressure down to the base where the dam is strongest. It also means the power generating equipment can be housed inside the dam itself. 
it's a clever solution. June 1979. Preparation for the main dam is well underway and the managers are determined to stay on schedule. Everything is going smoothly. But then the work comes to an abrupt standstill. There's a problem with the bedrock. As we dug into the foundations, we discovered, in fact, that the conditions weren't exactly what we had expected. It's disastrous news. The survey gave the bedrock a clean bill of health, but now engineers have come across a weak layer of crumbling rock, like a rotten tooth 20 metres down. The engineers fear that it won't support the weight of the dam. If they carry on building, the dam will collapse. Tunnels are dug down through the rock so that engineers can investigate the suspect layer. Only a thorough underground inspection will reveal the scale of the problem. They pray it's just one bad pocket of rock. Engineer Corrado Piacentin probes the secrets of the bedrock. This is the good rock, and this is the jointed weak rock. As you can see, it's very soft and not good for a foundation. The crumbling rock stretches right through the dam's planned foundations. Building an 11 million ton dam on top of this would be criminally irresponsible. Engineers need to come up with a solution, and fast. Workers stand idle while engineers and geologists wrestle with the problem. Finally, they hatch a plan that might just work. They can't build on the crumbling rock layer, but can they replace it? Like demonic dentists, the engineers drill out the decaying rock and give it a massive filling with extra strong concrete. It's doing the trick, but the extra work will take months and add $20 million to the budget. Fixing the crumbling rock layer could put the whole dam building schedule in jeopardy. And the relentless heat of the Brazilian sun is about to give the engineers another headache. May 1982. The 40,000 workers building the Itaipu Dam in the heart of South America have been grappling with a potentially catastrophic problem. Fractured bedrock beneath the foundations could cause the massively heavy structure to collapse. At stake, the supply of energy to Brazil's future generations. Engineers have come up with a solution, and it seems to be working. Like a bad tooth, the rotten rock layer beneath the Itaipu Dam site is being drilled and filled with extra strong concrete so that it will take the weight of the dam. At the same time, work on the dam's giant central walls continues. Workers must construct 18 concrete blocks, each four times as high as New York's Statue of Liberty. Every block will be cast separately. Huge steel structures are erected to receive the concrete and hold it in place till it's set. But it's not just the scale of the job that sets the engineers a major challenge. If they pour this amount of concrete the usual way, it just won't set properly. When concrete sets, the cement reacts with water, creating heat. In smaller concrete blocks, the core temperature cools and sets relatively quickly. But in massive blocks of concrete, the core temperature stays high longer. And as the surface cools and sets at a faster rate than the core, hundreds of cracks can appear, fatally weakening the concrete. And that's not the only problem. Temperatures here can easily soar past 40 degrees centigrade. If the huge blocks were allowed to set in the sun, they could reach more than 90 degrees. This too, would cause weak spots and cracks. Engineers conduct test after test on concrete set in these conditions to see how it reacts to extreme pressure. Even good concrete has a breaking point. 
Concrete dried by the sun will be much weaker. A solution must be found. The engineers have been wrestling with the concrete problem. Their answer? Refrigeration on a vast scale. Two huge cooling plants will chill every gram of concrete. Engineer Adalberto Chenu recalls the scene. La piedra era lavada con agua the stone was washed with icy water and blasted with cold air. Using a large number of ice chips, we were able to produce concrete with a mean temperature of just four degrees. And because we had an efficient transportation system, the concrete only reached seven degrees by the time we were pouring it into the molds. The scale of the refrigeration job is vast. The two plants have the cooling capacity of over 50,000 domestic freezers. By June 1982, the race is on to stay on schedule for the dam's completion in just three months' time. Seven vast overhead cableways now feed the dam's insatiable hunger for concrete from six huge production plants. This cement was, was being trucked in over thousands of kilometers. At one time, something like about uh, one 40-ton truck every 20 minutes was coming in with cement. 40,000 people are working at a pace equivalent to raising a 20-story building every 55 minutes. As the project nears zero hour, the pace is increasingly fierce. Adalberto Chenu ran the work schedule. During construction, we had really tight deadlines. We worked in two shifts of 12 hours for almost 360 days a year. As the countdown to the dam's completion and the valley flooding begins, conservationists begin their evacuation of wildlife. They hope to save 30,000 animals, relocating them to new areas or to wildlife sanctuaries. The rescue team knows that it's a race against time to save as many animals as possible before the flood. At the same time, the massive task of relocating over 8,500 families is underway. Compensation claims have been settled in lengthy negotiations and court cases. Some have been given money, others will be given a similar property and land elsewhere. Some of these families have lived and farmed in the Parana Valley for generations. For many, it's a devastating moment as they leave their homes forever. The seven kilometer string of dams is finally complete. Itaipu takes its place as one of the longest and most impressive dam structures in the world. But the next step is absolutely critical. Engineers will now close off the channel that diverts the Parana River. The river will then slowly flood the entire valley, creating the vast reservoir that will feed the dam and drive its power generating turbines. Once filled, the water pressure in the Itaipu Dam's reservoir will be like 4,000 bulldozers pushing ceaselessly against the dam walls. The engineers have done highly detailed calculations and they're confident that the massive walls are more than strong enough to hold back the water. But the filling of any dam reservoir is a critical moment. The concrete of the dam walls will be all that stands between the vast reservoir and 280,000 people living in and around Foz do Iguaçu. The failure of any major dam 
is always a major disaster because the amounts of water that would be freed would create a wave that would flow down the river and create tremendous damage. If the walls of Itaipu were to fail, the escaping wave of water would dwarf all but the most extreme flash floods Brazil has ever seen. A city-sized body of water would charge down the Parana Valley. The wave could reach 50 kilometers an hour and demolish all in its path but the most substantial buildings. The death toll would depend on whether people living in the valley had any warning of the impending flood. June the 3rd, 1976, the Teton Dam in Idaho, USA is being filled for the first time. Engineers spot a crack in the walls and try to repair it. They fail. Two days later, the western third of the dam simply disintegrates. Erosion at the base of the earth and rock dam is blamed. Nobody had warned local residents. The Teton Dam burst causes hundreds of millions of dollars in damage to property, livestock and crops. But miraculously, only 14 people are killed. October 1982. Seven years since construction began, it's the big day. The massive sluice gates in the diversion channel are closed. The river Piranha flows once again down its original course. It pours over the cofferdams. It charges into the reservoir. Whatever happens, there is no way to stop the water now. As the water rises, more and more pressure is put on the huge concrete walls. The reservoir will take 14 days to fill to its final depth of 100 meters. Everyone has been evacuated from the flood area, but some stay to watch their homes disappear under the rising water. and an army of 316 conservationists from Brazil and Paraguay set out on one last mission to save as many animals as possible from drowning. As the water levels slowly rise, small islands of high land are left behind. They're only temporary, and in a few hours they'll disappear forever beneath the surface. For now, they provide a last desperate refuge for terrified animals. Like modern day Noahs in tiny arcs, Fernal Carbonar and his rescue team try to save as many as they can before it's too late. We use some nets, we use some hooks for the snakes, and some of them we just caught them by the, by the tails. Soon, the animals have only treetops to cling to above the rising water. And there are hazards for the rescue team, too. The water was high, so you can imagine yourself going by boat on a treetop. You didn't really know what to expect to find between the leaves. Uh, sometimes you just uh, look to your right and about 20, 30 centimeters, you had a, a rattlesnake or, a, or some other kind of uh, poisonous animal. But apart from the odd scratch and bite, the rescuers managed to avoid serious injury. For days, the rescue progresses as the floodwaters continue to rise. Within two weeks, a vast stretch of the Piranha Valley is lost forever. Itaipu's reservoir now stretches as far as the eye can see. The dam's giant walls are holding back the water, but now the engineers must stop it rising any further. If the water flows over the top of the dam, the walls could be weakened and even start to crack, with potentially catastrophic consequences. Engineers have a trick up their sleeve. A crucial escape chute called a spillway has been built at the edge of the dam. It 
It's like a giant version of the overflow of your bathtub. When the water gets too high, it drains away without causing a flood. The big difference is this overflow must cope with 64 million litres of water per second. If it's been wrongly designed, the force of the water could damage it, setting the project back years. But there can be no rehearsals. The first time the spillway is used will be for real. October 1982. Excited crowds and world media gather to watch the big event. Engineers prepare to lift the sluice gates and open the spillway for the first time. The water begins as a trickle. It soon becomes a raging torrent. It's working. The spillway is taking the strain. It's controlling a cascade of water 22 times bigger than Niagara Falls. Brazil is now home to the biggest man-made waterfall on the planet. Engineer Adalberto Chanu witnesses the moment. It was a really unforgettable spectacle, and it will remain engraved on my memory forever. The engineers are relieved and elated for now, but their spillway worries aren't over yet. The spillway is handling the volume of water, but they know that all that water thundering off the end could affect the dam itself. At the Fornas lab in Rio de Janeiro, Roberto de Souza builds detailed high-tech models of dams to analyze the consequences of even the smallest miscalculation in spillway design. With this scale model of a dam spillway, we're carrying out an extremely detailed study of the effects of the water as it falls, of the energy that it can produce, energy that may damage the structure itself. When water crashes off the end of the spillway, it lands below the dam with great force, churning up the river. This energy must be dissipated using an upward curve like a ski jump that forces the water up into the air, reducing its force. The energy dissipation is so important that you could say a good design of spillway can avoid damage to both the actual structure and the land downstream. Engineers relied on scale models to get the angle of the ski jump just right. If it's wrong, the water will turn back on itself and could seriously erode the riverbank. And if the process continued over years, it could eat away at the foundations of the dam. Itaipu's engineers have calculated that there will be some erosion, but not enough to do any serious damage. All they can do for now is keep checking the riverbank and hope. If they've got it wrong, the structure of the dam itself could be in peril. The vast reservoir feeding the Itaipu Dam has been filled, flooding thousands of square kilometers of agricultural land and rainforest. 30,000 assorted birds, mammals and reptiles are saved from drowning by conservationists. But they all need new homes. Some are relocated, but 300 rescued animals are found a new home in a wildlife sanctuary. The Bella Vista Refuge isn't a zoo. The endangered species that were saved will be bred here and ultimately returned to the wild. Bella Vista is also one of the first centres aimed at educating local people about the wildlife living around them. 700 square kilometres of forest are lost in the valley flooding. But millions of new saplings are planted around the reservoir's edge. A conservation programme like the one mounted at Itaipu looks basic by modern standards but in the 80s it represents a trailblazing bid to minimize the damage caused by large-scale dams. Over the next nine years, Itaipu's final frenetic stage unfolds. 
With the dam walls finished, work begins on the power generating plant. Eighteen giant tubes to funnel water to the turbines, each as tall as a 30-storey building, go up. The turbines themselves weigh 800 tonnes, as much as two jumbo jets. They're so huge that special vehicles have to be built to transport them. At the heart of each turbine lies a rotor. They will spin magnets within a copper coil to produce electricity. Although the rotors are more than 16 metres across, they must be precisely installed to within one-tenth of a millimetre. And that's not all. The bulk of Itaipu Dam's electricity is destined for the huge cities of Sao Paulo and Rio de Janeiro, but they're over a thousand kilometres away. A massive network of pylons stretching right across the Brazilian countryside is erected. The electric power lines from the dam are long enough to stretch around the globe one and a half times. As the dam nears the moment when it will produce power, engineers nervously inspect the riverbank for signs of damage from water thundering down from the spillway. This is the kind of erosion that huge volumes of water can do when traveling at high speed. How serious is the erosion caused by the spillway? It doesn't look good. The engineers take precise measurements. They make further calculations. Is the erosion creeping ever closer to the dam's foundations? To their great relief, the engineers find their original predictions are right. The erosion is not getting any worse. The foundations of the dam are safe. Itaipu nears completion. The pace has been unrelenting. But the biggest engineering project South America has ever seen comes at great human cost. Records aren't precise, but 145 people are thought to have lost their lives in accidents while building in Taipu. May 1984, and Itaipu is about to fulfill its purpose and produce its first electricity. It's the moment everyone has been waiting for, the culmination of nine years of gruelling work. Water pours in through the gates at the top of the dam, thunders down and turns the turbines. For the engineers and workers, it's a triumph. One by one, further turbines leap to life, and in April 1991, Itaipu becomes the most powerful hydroelectric plant on the planet, pumping out enough electricity to light up 120 million light bulbs. And Itaipu is now feeding the energy demands of 24 million Brazilians in Rio de Janeiro and Sao Paulo. The electricity flows without a hitch for 10 years until January the 21st, 2002, 1.30 p.m. Without any warning, 13 of Itaipu's 18 giant turbines suddenly grind to a halt. Electricity production stops. The engineers at Itaipu are mystified. What has gone wrong? Rio and Sao Paulo are brought to a standstill. Traffic lights stop working, causing 30-mile backups. Subway systems close down. People are trapped in elevators. Offices, homes, factories are plunged into darkness. What is causing this cataclysmic power failure? Jose Ricardo de Silveira was in charge of power output. All the generators and all the transmission systems for Brazil suddenly cut out. At the time, we didn't know exactly what was going on. 
After frantic investigations, electricians finally track the problem down. A power line has collapsed. The transmission system can't cope with the power level that Itaipu is generating. It's tripped the switch that turns off the mighty dam's generating system. There's an inquiry. The result? $12 billion are poured into upgrading the transmission system to prevent future blackouts. In just one afternoon, Brazil's cities have seen just how dependent they are on Itaipu's electricity. Twenty years on, the Itaipu Dam remains an extraordinary achievement and was recently voted one of the seven wonders of the modern world by engineers. Today, a staggering 90% of Brazil's energy is generated by hydroelectric dams. Dams like this have helped Brazilian cities and industries to grow and brought electricity to people in remote areas of the country. But the heavy reliance on water power has come at a price. In recent years, lower rainfall levels have reduced the power output from dams, forcing power cuts and energy rationing. And all around the world, there's a growing awareness of the environmental havoc that hydroelectric dams can cause. At Itaipu, Dead treetops serve as a powerful reminder of a valley that has gone forever and the enormous price Brazilians have paid in their quest for power. <laughs>